So thank you, Gary. It is a pleasure to be able to, to speak with you. Thank you for taking the time today. Well, it's nice talking with you, Rafi. I appreciate you asking me to do this. Of course. So I imagine, I think most of our viewers probably already know who you are, but in case they don't, do you want to give us sort of a 30 second version of your background in the, the Pokemon world? Well, sure. In, uh, in the late 90s, I was involved in a, uh, a deal with Japan uh, that brought CD promo, Japanese, some Japanese promo cards over. Uh, had them all PSA graded, then showed them on the home shopping network here in the United States. And, uh, and then, of course, like all the other you know, kids, my boys got involved. They were about uh, eight, nine years old at the time. And when they got involved, I got a little more involved uh, on the, uh, you know, with them. And I got out of the business side because of difficulties dealing with Media Factory, uh, which isn't unusual. You know, the, uh, the Japanese companies are, uh, are pretty protective of their stuff and, and don't necessarily love to share it with everybody. So anyway, that it worked out well as a business deal initially, but then it, you know, that was it. And so then I got involved with my boys, you know, just collecting and uh, suddenly being the collector I am, I got very heavily into it where I was traveling from state to state here on the western side of the states and uh, made it up to Washington, Renton, where Wizards of the Coast was who produced the cards and went to all the shows all over with my sons, most of the time with my sons. and. Uh, you know, just started falling in love with, with uh, like I did with all my collectibles. And, uh, and I saw in the, the major interest there was in Pokemon in those first few months showed me that this was going to be a lasting, a lasting collectible, a lasting thing. Because I knew when those kids grew up, they were going to want what they couldn't get, you know, when they were younger. And so I just kept getting stuff, kind of hoarding it. And, you know, with the intention of selling, but then I never wanted to sell, you know, I wanted to keep all this stuff. And that's why I ended up with so much today. Uh, fortunately, as it turned out because of the market, but, you know, but it wasn't for that reason. It was just because I didn't want to sell them because I wanted to keep them. And my sons ended up kind of growing out of it. And, you know, they found girls and girls started to take precedence over Pokemon. Uh, and so they kind of fell out of it for a while because of that. And I didn't, I just continued on and I just kept up with the hobby. Even when the hobby took that big downturn, you know, in 2003 and on, uh, you know, a couple of us tried to keep the hobby alive, which fortunately it did. And here we are today. So that, that was kind of my beginnings with Pokemon. Yeah, thank you. Super interesting. So I'm curious because you mentioned something that, that Jake also says pretty frequently, right? That the kids who were really into it as a kid, as adults, will then want to buy back what they couldn't when they were younger. I mean, right. have you seen that kind of interest? You know, you said you, you could tell right away Pokemon is unique in another hobby or any other collectible that you've been involved with? I've seen it uh, quite a bit with sports cards, you know, because, uh, you know, especially, you know, for boys and girls, but primarily for boys you know, we're interested in sports and then we get interested in our local teams and, and all that. So yeah, pretty much, uh, I mean, I was collecting baseball cards in the 1960s of my favorite players like Sandy Koufax and Don Drysdale, a lot of the Dodgers. I grew up in Southern California. So, so I, I ended up uh, being you know, being interested in the Dodgers and the Lakers and the Rams and all the local teams. And so I, and I was a collector at heart. My father wasn't, my mother wasn't, but for some, my brother wasn't, but it just turns out I had a big interest in collecting stuff. And so I collected the, the cards, you know, the baseball cards. And then when I got older, I started collecting their rookies because I started to be able to afford it. And so, yeah, yeah, I, I, would, I would say it's a pretty common thing, you know, for us, you know, for collectibles to, you know, be tied into our memories, you know, whether it's Pokemon or sports cards or Yu-Gi-Oh or uh, Dragon Ball Z, you know, whatever, or Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And, you know, those are just things that we were interested in as kids. And so we just, uh, 
you know, got older and then we could afford a little bit more of that stuff. So that's kind of yeah. you know, how it was. Absolutely. So it seems like there, there's a community of adults, right, who are collectors of Pokemon, more on the higher end, like yourself. How, how would you describe that community to someone else? Yeah, well, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much on the super high end of that. You know, I'm 66. Uh, but then, then you have, you know, then you have fellas, you know, fellas like uh, Joel Angle, who's in his 50s, you know, big time collector. Uh, David Person, who I've known for years, uh, big time collector, and he's, I don't think he's 60 yet, uh, but he's right up there. Uh, so yeah, there, there is an older community, and most of us, uh, or in this case, I should say them, got interested uh, because of their kids. Uh, another, another one is E. Birdman, Eddie Brennischultz. You know, again, he's in his 50s. Uh, so yeah, there's, so there's a group of us that are older, but most of us got involved because of our kids. And then we saw the, you know, then, then we, you know, we became interested in them. And, and so that's why you'll see a little bit older community. And then you'll see, of course, a lot of those in their thirties and, you know, that actually had firsthand interest in them, you know, through their school yards and in that. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm curious, you know, you mentioned your, your collection right now, you never sort of ramped it down and you never, started selling it like are have you sold anything in the past are you tempted to do it now and just have like a you know easy retirement yeah i actually uh i actually have my collectibles uh there in storage in in northern california uh that's my real pokemon collection and uh just about all my special items the ones i don't even talk about much uh are there and then i have what I call my wall, my wall of Pokemon cards, which are like a secondary collection and ones that I intended to sell. I got them PSA graded the majority, you know, several thousand got them PSA graded. But then I just had difficulty selling them. I just didn't want to sell them. Every single one seemed to have a memory. And if I couldn't remember my anniversary, I could remember the complete story of all my special cards. And so, so I ended up with, I ended up with a wall of Pokemon in several rooms. Uh, they kind of look, I don't know if I can, how well I can show you this, but they kind of, let me see if that shows, you know, they all kind of look like, like that, you know, card boxes, you know, full of things. And those are the ones I intended to sell and just didn't sell very often. I put them on eBay just to kind of advertise and to show cards off. Uh, but I was never, never much of a seller. And then recently, you know, with this uh, big time interest with the virus thing and everybody being at home. And I mean, I get a hundred messages a day and the majority that that's just on Instagram. And the majority of those are asking about cards. You know, do you have this? Do you have that? You know, everybody is kind of scrambling to get, you know, to get certain cards. And I always intended to sell these. And so I've been putting up one or two things a day on Instagram and they, they just sell immediately. Uh, and I, I've always believed you buy at market, sell at market. So I sell them at market. And when I buy things, I buy things for, you know, what they're worth at the time. I don't look for, you know, discounts or deals or bargain in that. Because in my opinion, what's good for the hobby is buy at market, sell at market. And that's, yeah. key. that's what keeps the hobby healthy. And, you know, I know it's exaggerated, but let's say you and I and everybody else started dumping all our cards, right, for well below market. Well, that would bring the market down and, and that, you know, could, you know, destroy the market even. So I know it's, you know, one card or one little collection isn't a big deal, you know, but I've pretty much stuck to the thing, buy it, market, sell it, market. And so I started on Instagram uh, about a month or two ago, putting up some pretty special items, you know, some nice stuff. And they, they would get at market price and people would pay the market price. And, and if they wanted to trade at fair market, you know, I do a lot of that. Uh, not because I need what they have, but they need what I have. And if it's fair, it's fair. So uh, yeah. I, 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 that, that's pretty much the way, the way I've started selling a few things now because of that. Cause people, I just get bombarded with requests. Right. And I mean, I, I only have like, 
you know, I just started Instagram about six months ago and I only have like 7,000 followers in that, but I mean, I'm getting, uh, it's going up fast though. And I'm getting just hundreds of requests for, for stuff. So, so I have been doing some selling lately and that's the reason why. That makes sense. And do you find that for yourself as a collector, like do you enjoy your collection more? It means more to you when the cards increase in value or the value is kind of totally detached from the memories and the, the image on the card and what it means to you. For me, for me, the value has uh, up until just maybe the last five, six years, the value meant absolutely nothing to me. Uh, but then again, the value hadn't done what it's done, you know, back then. But of course the, the prices went up, you know, went up and, and I, yeah, I, it's, it's not a money thing. It's not a money thing with me. I know, I know a lot of the guys, you know, in, uh, you know, that work it as a business and, and I give them all the credit in the world for doing it. You know, they're supplying stuff that people want and, and that people, you know, might have difficulty finding elsewhere. And I appreciate that. Uh, for me, it's never been a money thing. Now, lately, it's changed a little bit, you know, because when, when I have a, when I have a card that was worth 80 bucks and now it's worth three, $400 and people are climbing over each other to get it. Uh, you know, you'd, you'd have to be a little bit silly not to pay attention, you know, to that. So I would say this last few months, I've paid more attention to value and sold some things because of the prices, but I haven't dipped into my collect my real collection. I haven't even seen my collection in Northern California in about four years. Oh, so wow. That, yeah, those I would never touch. You know, those I wouldn't touch. Uh, th those will, will be there when I'm not. So and I guess to someone who doesn't have a, a collecting mentality, how do you explain that, right? Like, how do you derive pleasure from owning something that you hardly ever see? Yeah, because even if you don't see it, the memory is there. It's kind of like if you lose a child. You know, you know, if you lose a child, you don't see the child, but the memories and the feelings are just as strong and they're, and they're there. And that's how I feel about my collection. Now, I do, I do keep some of the cards in my collection with me because people come over, they want to see them. I keep them in a local storage area. And uh, so I have about 20 cards, 10 first edition Charizards and uh, base Charizards and 10 Shadowless ones that I keep with me. And I take them to appearances and shows, you know, to show them off and stuff like that. Uh, but the other stuff I don't need to see. You know, I, I see them very, very clearly when they're, you know, 800 miles away. And I think I've always used that example of a lost child, you know. So, you know, no, I don't have to thumb through them. I have a lot of cards here I can thumb through for fun. So, so to me, 10 first edition Charizards and 10 Shadowless sounds like a lot already, but it sounds like that's a small fraction. Like how many of that type of thing do you have in the full collection? Well, in, in the full collection, uh, that's all I have of those cards. I think I have, I know I should know, right? 11 or 12 Shadowless and 10 or 11 first edition base. Um, but I don't have any others of those. But I have cases of, of, you know, boxes of, you know, original boxes. I actually have nine first edition base boxes. Six of them are in the case. I have... And they're all sealed. They're all sealed, yes. Are um, you ever going to crack it open for a special occasion? No, I've, I've done that. You know, I've opened boxes, you know, quite a few. In fact, even those sealed boxes are selling for a ton. I know sealed... Uh, empty sealed boxes where I just jimmy out the card. Uh, though those sell for eight hundred a thousand a piece right there, and I don't collect those. I sell those to people that are really you know interested, you know, in display using them as displays and that. But uh, yeah, yeah. So can you tell us about one of the craziest deals you've ever done? Well, I can tell you my worst deal I ever did. Yeah, uh, the worst one was a purchase I made from Belgium, I guess it was around 2005. And it was a case of first edition base Charizards. And of course, back then, I mean, I don't know, maybe it was 10, 12,000, maybe a little more, maybe 15 to 18,000. 
for a case of first edition base boxes. And that's six boxes. When they got here, I could, I, one of the top ones looked suspicious, so I checked it and it turned out they were, the top packs were correct and everything underneath was all garbage packs. And, and so that was uh, probably my worst deal. I had a very good relationship with PayPal and even though uh, maybe others might not have gotten it back, I did get my money back, but that, that, was, the, that was my worst deal. Uh, probably my best deal, and this is a good thing for your channel, the best deal I ever made was recently, and it's one that didn't go through. About a year ago, and I think you'll identify, and a lot of your you know, viewers will identify with this. Um, about a year ago, I decided that, you know, I have all these cards here that are secondary collection, and I just didn't want to do all the work and piecing them out, and my wife wanted more room, and because this, this stuff does, you know, take up quite a bit of space, you know, even though it's the, a lot of the cheaper stuff. But I put out some feelers, like with, uh, I asked some questions like of Scott S.M. Pratt and and rusty and I put the word out sent pictures and sent inventory I made inventory sheets and I'm no tech you know guru uh, so I, I, I it was a lot of work to put maybe around three four thousand PSA graded cards and then loose sets and all kinds of things into one big gigantic spreadsheet that at the time I priced and estimated at about three hundred and fifty thousand dollars for the stuff uh and so i put those feelers out and i was willing to let it go for about two hundred thousand and in fact on one of sm pratt's videos i i even that oh, a q a video he did i asked that question i said for a three hundred and fifty dollar collection you know what would you pay as a big lot right and I think he said something like 150 to 200,000. It's a lot of work. You got to piece it out. It's got to be worth your time. And <clears throat> well, I guess a lot of the guys felt that way because nobody showed very much interest. <clears throat> well, I'm not exaggerating when I tell you today that $350,000 worth of cards is probably worth about 1.5 million. Had I sold, had one of those guys taken me up on it, and and grabbed the lot for about two hundred thousand. I think I went down to one hundred ninety thousand. Uh, would if had one of them taken me up, that that one hundred ninety thousand would be worth one point five million. And it's been I think less than a year. Right. So so the best deal I ever made was one I never made. Because, that's a good way of putting it. I guess. Right? Do, do you think though, like this gets to the the bigger question, kind of the million dollar question, literally. Do you yeah. think that the value is going to hold or do you think that we're in a bubble? Okay. I mean, obviously none of us know for sure, but I can, I, I, I might have a, a little bit of an idea because I've been through a few things like this. Now, nothing has been like Pokemon. You know, I can say, you asked me a question earlier. Uh, well, yeah, some things have similar patterns and stuff like that and how you're buying back your memories nothing has been and i've collected things from 1920s pulp science fiction to mad magazines to golden and silver age comedy i've collected maybe anything you could mention at one time or another talk about trading cards uh, i have trading card sets maybe at one time i had all of them from the 1960s 70s 80s and 90s and i still have boxes full of binders of you know the munsters trading cards and and uh, uh, the I-Team trading, I mean, just almost anything you could think, fantasy cards, everything. Well, I had <clears throat> all of those, all of those were popular for a while and fell off. Pokemon, nothing has been like Pokemon. Nothing has been, has happened like what's happened with Pokemon. Plus, when they first came out, there was never, I mean, it was like the Beatles came to town I mean, the frenzy was just crazy, right? I mean, you could, the parents couldn't, at Christmas time, they couldn't find anything. I, I would sell because I got bombarded back then too in 1999 when Christmas came in December. I got so, I just got 
you know, so many requests for, for things that uh, we opened up, me and the son, my sons opened up everything for fun and filled binders. But I mean, we had pages of Charizard, pages of Gyarados, pages of everything. Uh, but then it, was, it got to be so big, I opened an account on Yah uh, Yahoo USA. There was a Yahoo Auctions had a USA version back then. And in fact, I got up to 2000 rated. I did a lot of sales on there, not on eBay at the time, although I was a member of eBay in the nineties, but on Yahoo, Yahoo uh, America. And so I started selling all those cards, even, even back then, because the frenzy, the people were going everywhere because they wanted to get cards for Christmas for their kids. And so I, I just sold a load of them then. But anyway, the frenzy has never been like anything else I've ever seen than it was with Pokemon. Probably since 1964 when the Beatles came to the Hollywood Bowl in Los Angeles. It was that kind of a thing, you know, where, I mean, screaming girls or, you know, the screaming kids for Pokemon. I mean, that was, that was it. So, so I you know, with saying that, what I think is going to happen next, it's so unprecedented, you know, it's hard to be confident. But if I had to give you my honest opinion, and I kind of hate saying this, but I, I kind of feel it's important to say what I feel, and then later you can laugh at me, because uh, <laughs> it's going to be a record of it. But I wouldn't be surprised if in the next six months to a year, Maybe there was a bit of a tail off, maybe 10, 15%, you know, drop that will be easily recovered next year, uh, assuming the economy comes back, you know, pretty strong. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with our election. So I don't know. I'd kind of like to wait till after November to make a real guess on what I think is going to happen in 2021. Uh, but right now, I would say maybe a 10, 15% percent drop off could happen with the disclaimer that I could be totally wrong because Pokemon has never act I mean nothing's acted like Pokemon has right right and I'm curious do you, do you see um I guess are you more excited about the value of trophy cards or, or the cards that come in sets I I mean I love Scott and I love Scott's I mean he stayed here at my house we've had conversations we uh, I couldn't respect anybody more, any more than I do him, but it's not my thing. You know, I am not into, uh, and I could have been like, you can assume, you know, I could have been, you know, for a year I've had trophy cars. I have some now put away in that Northern California storage. I'm not even sure what all is there. Uh, but it's not my love. It's not the thing that I care most about the, uh, I also, uh, I also really respect and like, we met at Worlds last year, David Person. And I mean, his, his uh, English trophy card set is uh, incomparable. You know, nobody has anything close to what he has. Uh, again, it's not my thing. I've had opportunities for years for way, 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 way cheaper prices to collect that stuff. And just didn't have the interest in it you know, myself, and I, I'm a strong, you know, proponent of, you know, collect what you love, and not what you think is going to go up in value, or, or whatever, just collect what you love, and so even though I appreciate both Scott's and David's trophy collections, uh, I have no personal interest in those at all. Uh, what, what do I think the prospect is? You know, I, I hate I hate to comment. I hate to comment too much, you know, when some someone's almost, you know, total net worth is tied up in in something, you know, to you know, to uh, you know, pass judgment on on the possible future of those type items. Uh, all I can say is that since I don't have an interest, I haven't followed it closely enough. Right. And so you know, well, I, I get, on the opposite end of things, how about the modern cards? Are you interested in what, what's coming out now? Do you find yourself buying some of the newer stuff? You know, you know what? I, I, I couldn't be happier with these, new, these newer releases, you know, these releases from the last several years. I mean, I, 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 see, I see the kids. I mean, I go to a, quite a few events, you know, at, at card shops and stuff like that, you know, to meet people. And I see the interest in it. I saw the, the recent 
pre-releases and and how many people showed up in the in the in the chatter and the interest uh that is critical for the hobby you know having having these new sets now personally am i much into them you know very little i i can only do so much i also even though i'm an old man i also have a five-year-old daughter and so that i mean she keeps me you know busy and my wife is going for her masters at university and and so you know i don't have a lot of time to get into new you know new hobbies or new sets and so though i'm not personally involved in the newer sets i couldn't be happier every time one comes out i i'm, I, I'm just thrilled to death because those 10 year olds today that are that are playing with those and collecting those 10 15 years from now you know they're they're going to be you know they're 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 going to be going back to those and trying to get the earlier sets and going all the way back to Watsy. You know, it, I've always said, and I've said this, and people have heard me say this many times, uh, Pokemon is safe for 15, 20 years after the last set is released. There's no end in sight for how long sets are, but let's say it stopped today. The hobby and the values are good for another 15, 20 years. That I have seen with numerous collectibles over the years. Mm. That's very interesting. So I guess we, we have about a couple minutes left. So I want to ask you one last question. Of course. Um, don't, don't put too much talk into your answer. This can be a fun one. But what, what is something that you think right now, um, a card or a set is overvalued? And what is one that is undervalued? There is, I mean, base unlimited. It's kind of like, uh, it, will the man, 1952 Mickey Mantle rookie ever be overvalued? Never will happen will the 1986 michael jordan Fleer rookie ever be overvalued never you know that that'll never happen either uh the was the 1979 opg wayne gretzky which you might see one of my favorites you see that picture there hand painted and autographed by wayne gretzky will will his 79 opg canadian card ever be overvalued never ever ever well, the Charizard first edition base never will be overvalued. And, you know, those are high right now. Base set is safe. Jungle, Fossil, Team Rocket, the Gyms, the Neos, those are all safe. You know, those will be fine. Those will be fine. So that I would say Watts Sierra primarily base set is uh, will be very safe now what isn't you know those those 2003 to 2007 sets you know the EXs and and those those have really gained in popularity now but almost everything has is that going to hold up man I sure hope so because uh just because the interest waned the quality of those sets you know are, are high quality sets so I can't even say that though, even though the, the hobby dropped off during those years before it fired up again, uh, I can't say those. Um, so ironically, like those could be some of the most in-demand cards because they just weren't printed as much. They weren't printed as much. So people want to rediscover that time that they missed out on. True, because of the demand. Yeah, absolutely true. Now, if I had to pick something, you know, on the negative side, I would say Japanese cards because they have everything, almost everything that you would want. Quality, card stock quality. I mean, if you pull a card out, they're automatic tens, pretty much. Uh, the only thing they're missing is that is that personal memory thing. Because very, very few of us were were brought up on you know Japanese cards you know we despite your we, best efforts at the time right yeah I know despite my best efforts yeah uh-huh uh but that was pre-English and so that that was kind of successful because everybody had heard of Pokemon pocket monsters but nobody had seen them in English yet so yeah that's why it was big then but I I would probably have to have to say you know overall maybe a little bit overvalued and and not even overvalued because they're not really valued too high even now. I just don't see the long-term 
uh, success of Japanese cards. And I kind of hesitate saying that because so, I mean, I have more, more than you could jump over. Right. And I know a lot of people, a lot of people collect only those. And it's wonderful because they're in, a, they have everything. I just, if I had to pick something that I wouldn't want to invest my money in, it would be in Japanese cards from any era. Right. Sorry guys. <laughs> I got, I got no, that's a good answer. And, and, I hope, you know, and I might be wrong, right? <laughs> for sure. Nobody knows. But I think, you know, given the amount of experience you've had in the hobby and with other collectibles too, right, that have a lot of parallels, I think you're, these have been fantastic insights. So that concludes our time. But thank you so much, Gary. It was really a pleasure. Well, thank you so much. And I, thanks for asking me. And you know what? Why don't we do this next year again and, yeah. you know, just, and see what some of the things I said so everybody can laugh at me a little bit. We would love to. We will replay some of your predictions and see what happened. <laughs> you know. Thank you. Take care. You also. Bye-bye.